All right, so we will get started. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on a Friday in the month of April for this important conversation. Um, as you know, today we're going to focus on the various ethical tensions in higher education and student affairs graduate preparation programs. And we're going to focus on issues related to recruitment, admission, support, and employability of graduate students in the current context of multiple pandemics. First, I wanna make a few quick logistical notes. The webinar is being live captioned and those captions can be accessed by clicking the CC button in your menu bar. The webinar is also being recorded and will be available afterwards on the ASH website. Throughout the webinar, you can pose questions to the panelists by using the Q&A feature. And I, I see um, that the chat is already actively going too. So later in our time together, we plan to address as many of the questions that you have posed as possible. So this conversation is co-sponsored by two entities. So the Council for the Advancement of Higher Education Programs, which is a council of the Association for the Study of Higher Education. And I wanna first thank Jason Gilbo, ASH Executive Director for his support of this initiative. This conversation is co-sponsored by NASPA, Student Affairs Administrators in Higher Education and specifically the NASPA Faculty Council. And I'm so excited that this conversation is a partnership between scholars and practitioners in our field. So we um, wanna move into some very brief um, introductions. And um, my name is Ryan Miller and I'm assistant professor and higher education program director at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, which is located on the traditional homelands of the Catawba, Waxhaw, Chira and Sugary peoples. And relevant to this conversation, I also serve as the program chair for KHEP. Hey y'all, my name is Sandra Ardwan. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I am joining today uh, from the lands of the Sugary Catawba and Cherokee East peoples um, at my home in Dallas, North Carolina. Uh, and I serve as an assistant professor uh, at App State. And I'm also a member of the NASA Faculty Council. Uh, I serve as the region three rep, which is the Southeast. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sanja, for being a brilliant co-organizer and moderator of this event. It's been wonderful planning it with you over the last few months. So now I wanna move on to ask um, our panelists to briefly introduce themselves. And how about we just go in the order on the right side of the screen? Hello, my name is Darren Pierre. I'm a clinical assistant professor in the higher education program here at Loyola University of Chicago on the traditional homelands of the three fires, Ajibiwi, Ottawa, and Potawatomi Nation. And my pronouns are he, him, his. Hello, good morning. My name is Dean Squire. I use he and his pronouns, and I'm an assistant professor and program coordinator of the Counseling Student Affairs Program at Northern Arizona University. And I'm speaking to you today from the traditional ancestral lands of the Navajo, Hopi, Paiute, Havasupai, Hualapai, and other tribal nations. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Juan Guardia. I serve as Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students at the University of Cincinnati. I use he, him, his, and el pronouns. Um, I'm coming from the lands of the Shawnee and Miami peoples here in Cincinnati, and I'm an adjunct faculty member in the Educational Studies Master's Program that has a concentration in higher ed administration. Hi, everyone. I'm Susan Marine. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm an associate professor and program director at Merrimack College, which is located on the ancestral homelands of the Penacook and Abenaki peoples. Great, thank you to all of our panelists and we look forward to hearing more from you in just a few minutes. Um, before we do, I wanna set a little bit of context for our conversation. So um, this conversation began across several sessions during the KHEP pre-conference at, at ASH last November. And for those of you who have, who have not been before, that KHEP pre-conference um, often serves as a space for higher ed faculty and program directors and, and grad students and researchers um, to come together and discuss current issues in our programs and how we can address them. So of course, um, at that time um, and ongoing, we convened in the midst of multiple pandemics, the global health pandemic and heightened visibility of racial injustice and anti-Black racism in particular, as well as deep economic inequality. So all of these issues, of course, um, affect our students and faculty and all of us. And we became acutely aware as well of the deteriorating job market um, in higher ed. So according to the Chronicle of Higher Education last year, colleges and universities lost a net total of at least 650,000 employees. 
and that is a 13% drop from February 2020 to February 21. And at no point since the Labor Department actually began keeping those tallies in the 1950s have colleges ever shed so many employees at such an incredible rate. Um, so in light of that, we all ask questions of each other at the pre-conference, including how will our students find jobs um, in the current context? We wondered, are, are we doing all we can to prepare our students for the realities of the market and their future careers, while also pushing our field to be more equitable and just? How do we respond to those institutional pressures to continue recruiting students or even recruiting more heavily in the current context? And also, what are the ethics of recruiting and admitting students with minoritized identities, in particular students of color, to campuses and programs that are um, not fully prepared to support them? So all of that um, prompted the discussion we're having today around ethical dilemmas that we face in this moment. And we view today's conversation as a starting point to identify and name and explore some of these current ethical issues we face in higher ed and student affairs programs. And we hope and plan to continue this conversation um, as well as importantly, identify actions we can all take throughout the next year and beyond. So we're so grateful that you are here to be part of this conversation. When you all registered for this webinar, you were asked about the type of ethical dilemmas or concerns that you're witnessing from your vantage point. And we have read through the more than 240 responses from those who registered and identified a few recurring themes that we wanna share with you for further context. So first you identified the high costs of HESA programs. So top of mind, of course, would be financial costs to students and, and you know, high loan debt, lack of tuition waivers in some places, low GA stipends and unpaid internships. And that's all before graduates take jobs that often have low starting salaries. But you all also identified the non-monetary costs in terms of student well-being, issues of burnout and balance and health and wellness. Um, also facing students are the recruitment and admissions processes that many of our programs structure. So students may be asked to provide test scores and reference letters and arrange travel to attend interview days. So all of this um, was also tied to employability resulting from higher ed programs and the job market that I referenced earlier. So one attendee put it well, um, the challenge of accepting students knowing the job market has basically imploded. So what are the current GA options, support structures for career searching and return on investment for students? Diversity, equity, and justice cut across each of the other themes, as you might imagine. In particular, white supremacy and racism and how this manifests in recruitment, student experience and support, curriculum, as well as the unemployment and underemployment of black, indigenous, and people of color. You also identified toxic workplace cultures in our field, including ideal worker norms, hazing, and favoritism. You also identified issues of program quality and equity in program management. And so that includes institutional pressures on programs as institutions push for extensive recruitment and high enrollment, even at this time, offering quality programs that meet basic standards with dedicated and qualified faculty, as well as issues of workload distribution within programs as non-tenured and minoritized faculty often have a disproportionate workload. Lastly, we saw concerns around professional development and preparation for the field. And I'll, I'll just quote um, a few participants in what you all said. One stated the challenge this way, preparing graduate students for student affairs as it should be versus what it is. Another stated a concern about preparation that accounts for the real political issues that grads will find in their jobs. And finally, an attendee said the promise of a sustainable career in higher ed that may be affected by post pandemic changes of our field. So, so thank you again for sharing all of that when you registered and with all of that context in mind, I will now hand it over to Dr. Ardwin to begin moderating our panel. Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Miller. Really appreciate sort of that framing and context uh, as we sort of get into our panel discussion today uh, to tease out um, some of these sort of tensions and talk about uh, why we think they might be sort of most prevalent in the field, as well as um, perhaps thinking about how we've experienced them um, from the faculty side or how we have heard students talk about them as well. So uh, really appreciate uh, our panelists here today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that uh, folks can see uh, more of each other uh, as we engage in this conversation. 
and see you as you're sharing uh, your wisdom uh, around these ethical tensions. So uh, thank you all for being here today uh, from different types of institutions, from different parts of the country. Uh, and so really giving us um, with different roles uh, in, in the grad prep process as well. And so I appreciate your time and effort. And so what we wanna start off with is a question around, uh, it'll all really be from your perspective, but um, from your perspective in your specific role related to graduate education um, at the specific type of institution where you work and in the region of the country you're in, what are some of the ethical tensions that you believe exist? Do you agree with the themes from the survey? Um, and if so, maybe which ones do you think are most prevalent? Uh, Dr. Maureen, do you want to kick it off for us? <laughs> sure. Thanks, Sanja. And thanks so much to you and Ryan for creating this wonderful event and to my wonderful fellow panelists for being here today, too. Um, you know, I'm located in New England, about 20 miles north of Boston. Uh, Merrimack College is a um, Augustinian institution that's moving toward um, kind of a, a research to status from being a liberal arts college for most of its founding. And when I think about the ethical tensions that I think my students are facing and, and students in New England more broadly, I think everything in the, in the survey resonates. Um, it resonates and it hurts, right? It's painful to read and think about the ways in which our field, which stands for so much that is good and right about higher education, still participates in and in some cases perpetuates, you know, pernicious practices. Wow, that's a lot of alliteration, sorry. Um, but I guess I would add a couple to the list and we may not have time to talk about them today, but I'd like to add a couple of them. And these are, um, ethical quandaries, I think, around helping our students discern and create paths for themselves that feel authentic and, and respectful of who they are as whole human beings. Um, I'm not sure that our field currently or grad prep in general is equipped for that because we are so driven by accomplishment and achievement discourses. Um, and um, I, I think that's a real issue. I'd like us to become committed to more holistic um, development of our students and thoughtfulness about what's best for them as human beings. Um, and the other piece that I, I kind of, I guess I'd want to add and name is just this ongoing challenge with the fact that we're all feeling a lot of pressure to publish or perish um, above and beyond. And um, the needs of our students and the needs of our communities often need equal amounts of service and human dedication from us. And, and we can't always give them. And that's an ethical quandary too, that we've decided to invest in and participate in the neoliberal metrics of the academy. So um, many of us, I won't say all of us by any means. So I just wanna add those to the list, but I think it's a really comprehensive list and it's a great place to start our conversation. Yeah, thanks for that, um, for that Susan. And I, I appreciate you naming sort of like uh, the people element in this, right? That um, the structures we have set up maybe haven't, aren't working for students, but that maybe they aren't working for um, faculty and administrators who work with these programs either, right? And so the ethical tensions is not just program to student, uh, but it could be with colleague to colleague uh, as well. Um, and thinking sort of about the, the broader systemic issues related to how people experience uh, graduate preparation. Uh, Dr. Guardia, thoughts from you. Sure, so um, I'm located at the University of Cincinnati. So regionally, we are in the Midwest. Um, it's pretty interesting because where we're at at the institution, we are less than three miles away from downtown Cincinnati and right across the river from Northern Kentucky. Um, so as an urban R1 institution, a lot of the students that we attract are really from what we say the tri-state area. So Northern Kentucky, uh, Southern Ohio and Southern Indiana. And so our students really look at our institution and our graduate program from a more of a regional feel. And so one of the things that we try to tell the students, especially myself as an administrator, as an adjunct faculty, is that we're, the program we have at UC is not your traditional higher ed program that you would see on other campuses across the country. Uh, when we tell students about our program, we I don't know, we don't have the traditional visiting days. Uh, we don't have the traditional way of setting up students with graduate assistantships. And so we give them that information heads up. Ethically, we wanna let them know um, and transparency what we offer um, a lot of them want to stay in the region and or are working at our institution. And so it gives them the opportunity to obtain a graduate degree while staying in the area. But we want to make sure that we're relaying that information from the beginning so they don't have um, any different ideas of what the program is able to offer. 
Um, and for a majority of the time that we've been and the program's been established, a lot of our students have been from the region. We've been attracting students from outside this area, which has been great. It's making the program grow. Um, we want to definitely uh, keep it honest and keep it true with regards to what we're able to offer right now and that it's a program in process and growing in that midst. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you um, for sort of getting into some of those uh, tensions around recruitment and admissions mm -hmm. and uh, what that looks like in terms of um, are we selling something we can't provide uh, to students or, you know, are the expectations um, not aligned in that uh, sort of their mindset going in uh, to the program and things of that nature as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Squire, thoughts from you. Hi, thanks. Um, so I'm at Northern Arizona University. Um, we're a regional university. Uh, we have about 15 students in each of our master's cohorts. Um, we're also located 70,000 feet up on a mountain um, in Northern Arizona. So sort of in the middle of nowhere. Um, well, it's a great place, but it's also in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we're an HSI. We have about 40% first gen students, 40% students of color. Um, and another contextual piece, I guess, is that a large majority of our student affairs professionals um, and leadership on campus don't have traditional student affairs backgrounds and haven't come through student affairs programs. Um, so there's a little bit of a mismatch with sort of what we're teaching in the classroom and what they're actually doing in their uh, GAs. I think my general worldview of uh, what's happening right now is that, and I'm, obviously this is contextual, you know, based on my experience here, but um, that our division of student affairs and many of the professionals within them consider our GAs to be a means of production um, for maintaining, you know, their programmatic systems and the outcomes of their leadership. And, um, you know, as Susan said, very based on these neoliberal metrics. And ultimately we are creating this like system, the cycle of essentially replacing GAs into these positions and so we recruit the students with or without sharing the reality um, of what it's like. And we're basically breeding, you know, this, this system, breeding these, these people to go out into the field who um, oftentimes I think become shells of themselves as a result of the experience that they have. Um, and they're experiencing coercion by their supervisors. Um, they have this sort of fear of failure, fear, fear of not being able to, you know, produce enough or have the longest resume or have the most internships um, or experiences. Um, and so I think that that's a huge issue. And all this ultimately leads to a lot of mental health issues. Um, and I think as Susan mentioned too, sometimes they get jobs that are, pay really poorly uh, and then end up leaving the field altogether. Um, and so I, I experienced a lot of that. And I think, you know, based on the list that um, Ryan shared, the ethical uh, issues that really resonate with me are the financial costs, um, particularly the cost of living. Um, Blackstaff is not a huge city, but it's incredibly expensive to live here. Um, and cost of living matches some big cities like DC. Um, so it is very expensive. And unless you're in a res life position, you know, you don't get that covered. We have a lot of identity-based issues. The campus is incredibly diverse, but the city is incredibly white. Um, and I would say organizationally, I am the only faculty member in the program. I'm also the program coordinator. Um, and so there's not that much support for the students except for me. Um, and so there's just a lot that rests on me. And so, you know, I'm a, a counselor, an advisor, a scheduler, a problem solver, all of those things. Um, and I guess the last one, which I just sort of remembered as Ryan was talking was this curriculum piece, right? So I try to teach the field as it is, um, not as it should be. And sometimes that there's a conflict between sort of um, what they expect to learn in the programs or what they expect their student affairs experience to be um, because they come from these really, you know, great undergraduate experiences and they come here and it's sometimes not what they were wanting. Um, and so that's definitely something that I always have to deal with. Um, so anyways, yeah, I'll pass it on to the next person. Yeah, thanks for all of that, Dean. And uh, I appreciate too naming some of the things that are uh, sort of external to the institution and not always in our sphere of influence to necessarily move or shake, right? So uh, I also work in a mountain town, right? In Boone, North Carolina, and it's expensive to live there too. Um, and so how does that play into some of these costs, which are maybe not things we can control, um, but are having a, a significant impact um, on our students and also perhaps on our ability to recruit 
um, faculty and staff to our institution as well. So thinking about how that sort of layers into educa educational partners uh, that we're able to acquire for internships and GAs and all of those sorts of things as well. Uh, so I appreciate sort of that broader uh, lens there. Dr. Pierre, thoughts from you? I have a cat and she sometimes photo bombs and we're living in a pandemic. So I just want to give context. If you see a furry animal come through, she, we have intention in how we share space during a pandemic. I really think someone needs to write the book called The Miseducation of the Higher Education and Student Affairs Educator because there is so much we need to trouble around so many pieces. I want to particularly pay attention to the idea of employability. Loyola University of Chicago is situated in Chicago, Illinois. And when we are meeting in person, we are right off the magnificent mile. I, I cannot think of a more dynamic piece of real estate than to be able to go into class right off of downtown Chicago. And a lot of our students, the conversations around social justice and around diversity and inclusion and, um, and proximity to an urban location is what gave them interest in being at Loyola. That also gives 3,000 other people interest in being at a place like Loyola or Northwestern or DePaul or the University of Chicago. When we talk about employability, I think one of the ethical things we need to do is to be honest about what does it look like? You know, I think there's a season of sacrifice and a season of harvest. And if you are trying to look at major markets of your Chicago, your Atlanta, your DC, your Los Angeles, your New York, your Boston, you're really going to have to discern your experiences in a different way than someone who is less geographically bound or bridled to a, a place. And so I think about those ethical pieces that in higher education programs we need to start talking about, I think that's one of them. I think the other piece, and if I feel so bad, I used to be a practitioner, which is I appreciate being a clinical assistant professor because I, I have that practitioner hat sometimes. I think another piece that I probably wouldn't have said when I was a practitioner, but I certainly would say now, is I hope that student affairs can get more um, proficient in the conversation of fundraising and development. I think the work of student affairs is critical. It is critical to human development, to being powerful and a leader, whether it's in nonprofit or industry. But what we don't do is curate powerfully those relationships beyond the four-year experience and say, how are you giving up your treasure as you are able, as you're, of your time as you are able, as an alum, back to this institution, particularly back to this division. Because I think that's where we begin to respond to some of these things around limited resources, where as Dean was talking about, we have graduate students who are doing really the work of professional staff but being at, paid at a paraprofessional level. If we're going to start really getting at some of these inequities, we've got to really start thinking about our work from a different paradigm. I think higher education programs need to think about having development as a core part of their curriculum, because we got to really begin to talk about how do we talk powerfully about the narrative, not only for the undergraduate experience, but for those alums who we hope to be partners in the enterprise as we move forward. Yeah, and I appreciate sort of thinking creatively maybe about uh, ways we seek solutions to this, Darren, because um, you know, in a lot of our states, if we're at a public and public state institution, we're not getting more state money for this. Um, and so thinking about how do we get creative, uh, whether it is in terms of sort of stipends and things like that, or professional development funding for students or um, emergency funding uh, for grad students and, and all of these sorts of pieces. So appreciate those comments. Um, so wanted to dig a little bit deeper uh, into some of these ethical tensions. Um, and some of you have started talking about this already, but Dean, I'd like to hear from you a little bit about um, how honest do you think we are about recruitment and admissions uh, in, in higher education and student affairs graduate preparation programs? Um, I, I, I guess I can't speak for everybody, but I would probably say not that honest. Um, I try to be pretty, I don't know, people who know me know that I'm pretty clear and transparent yes. with what I think about everything. So I try to be as clear and transparent with my students as I possibly can. Um, you know, I tell particularly my students of color and or queer students, you know, what it's like to be on this campus, um, what, what the city is like, what, you know, the general region is like, um, kind of the political atmosphere of Arizona, um, and what are those challenges and what are some of the benefits of um, coming to NAU. Um, and I try to draw on my own experiences to do that as a queer person of color. 
Um, but also try to couch it within, you know, the student experience to be a little bit different. You're gonna have your cohort, you might live on campus, you might be in res life, which is where half of our GAs are. Um, so they're gonna, you know, they're gonna have some kind of built in community there. Um, and I try to couch my recruitment and admissions within the broader conversation about how we discuss social justice issues within our program. Um, so usually when I'm doing these recruitment calls, um, or giving, you know, our webinars about our program or whatever, you know, we talk about our curriculum and um, how we sort of integrate that. And I always start with our admissions and say, you know, we ask very specific questions um, in our essays. We don't require the GRE. I'm not interested in how much social cultural capital you have, um, but I'm interested in your worldviews about the field and about leadership and about social justice and if you have something to say. Um, so, you know, when I got here, our cohort was about 14% students of color. Um, and by shifting completely to holistic admissions, we're now at 55% students of wow. color in two years. Um, and so, you know, that was really important for me yeah. to, to integrate, you know, to move our process uh, forward into the future a little bit. I mean, that doesn't mean that like we still don't, you know, only have, you know, one black student every year, right? And so there are certainly concerns um, around that. Um, and I'm always still balancing. So I guess the ethical tension is increasing our structural diversity, but also knowing that I can't always support all of these students who are here as the only faculty member. Um, and our division is incredibly white. And, um, you know, I want our program to match the population of our students here on campus and the, their future students that they're working with. Um, but I also know that there is potentially racial trauma that that's going to happen when they get here. And, you know, even just yesterday, I got emails from students about things that were happening um, in their GA position. So, you know, I, I am as truthful as possible in order to prepare them for what they might experience here if they choose to come here. Um, also knowing that those students might not choose to come here, um, which is just something that I think we have to deal with, you know. Um, and I think is, you know, at the end of the day, whenever, this, whenever the students are like, you know, I'm still deciding on multiple institutions, I always say, you know, you only you know what's best for you. Yes. So you can make that decision, whether or not it's NAU or not, that's fine. You know, if you come here, I'm gonna support you as the best I can. Um, but if you find that another place is better for you, then I will 100% support that decision. And I hope to see you at conferences in the future and work with you at some point. Um, but if that's not right now, then that's totally fine as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel a, a lot of what you're saying, Dean, and um, have experienced some of that um, as well in thinking about uh, we want to grow, right, um, the percentage of students who identify as BIPOC or queer or from different religions or international students on a campus. Um, and what do you do if you know your campus or, or community uh, is also not willing to support that? And so how do you be transparent about those in a way enough that students uh, can sort of choose their if they want uh, to sort of take that risk um, or not take that risk uh, in their own sort of educational journey. So appreciate those nuanced comments there. Um, Dr. Guardia, you mentioned a little bit about recruitment admissions. Anything else to add here? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, it's interesting when I've had my conversations with undergrads who have, who have either attended or um, are at UC and say, I want to go into the field and I want to stay here at UC. I said, well, um, let me keep it 100% and real with you. This is exactly how the program is set up here. It's a good program. It'll get exactly what you want out of it based on where you aspire to be within the field. Um, but the reality is this, you know, I'll help you seek out assistantships because I'll hear about it through the division. If I see some, I will send it to my faculty colleagues over in um, education to spread that to their graduate students. Um, but I've told them, I said, you know, that's one of the, the things that the program still continues has to work on is establishing what a GA recruitment will look like. You know, what does a visiting days look like so y'all folks can come an interview with a variety of different units. Um, you know, and then actually one of the things that I try to share with the students as well is that, you know, there needs to be more communication across the institution about what are all their assistantships that are being offered. A majority of those that are being offered will be on our main HR website. So students will try to go there as well to seek them out. And so, you know, they'll look at it and they'll say, okay, you know, well, what does it look like on other programs? I said, well, more traditional programs may have their visiting slash days so they can come and visit and do their interview, their assistantship and the interviews and so forth. Um, but, you know, I don't deter them, but I want to be honest with them. Um, and then some have also said, you know, touching on what Dion mentioned is, you know, the diversity on campus, you know, we're very black, white at UC and in the region that we're in. 
um, you know, one student uh, about a year and a half ago said, you know, what does the Latinx student population look like on campus? And I'm like, it's actually pretty small. Um, and they said to me, well, I, I only see you. And I'm like, well, I'm the only Latino senior level administrator within the division as it is. And they just stay a little bit shocked. Um, but I said, that's just the reality of the situation. That doesn't mean that we're not here to assist and work with everyone else um, that's here for the program. So I think one of the best things I try to explain to the students is this is what we're able to offer. If it's a good fit for you right now from where you're at, I'll do whatever I can to assist you from the practitioner side and also with my faculty colleagues. Um, but if it's not, let me know. And I'm more than happy to assist you in looking at other programs that either may be in state and or out of state. Great, thank you for that. Um, and I appreciate naming that um, the sort of GA process looks different everywhere, right? And so I think there's also sort of a, a philosophy or a, um, I don't know what the word I want is, but an assumption um, about uh, higher ed and student affairs programs is that they're all sort of uh, lockstep of, they all offer GAs with full tuition admission or full tuition, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Remission, yeah, um, and things like that. And that's not true. And so, um, Sometimes students either aren't aware of that or don't know all the different options and, and what does that mean? And so uh, my next question, Dean, if you want to chat a little bit about this is, um, how do we acknowledge these sort of differential opportunities or differential support structures uh, that students may receive either in the application process or when they're with us on campus? Sure. Um, sorry, I've just been, there's lots of questions in the Q&A, so trying to there get is, over yeah. there too. Yeah. Um, so all of our GAs uh, do receive the same package except for our res life folks who also receive housing, which I think is generally pretty standard. Um, however, I think there are like inherent inequities in sort of how they do their work, how much work they have to do. Um, and then for the folks who are not res life GAs, as I mentioned earlier, the cost of living for the area. Um, so, you know, I think there's, it kind of goes multiple ways. So like res life's, GAs end up doing, you know, 25 to 30 plus hours a week in their GAs, um, but they also get the housing. Um, but the other folks are maybe actually just working their 20 hours, but they don't get the housing. So there are sort of these, you know, I don't know if it's causing tensions in the program. I don't see it between the students as far as sort of what they get. Um, but I think we just, like you said, have to have general conversations about sort of what, um, what the stipend looks like, what the cost of living looks like. And these are, these are, way bigger question than we can answer or, or provide solutions to. And there are even issues that our faculty and staff are dealing with um, here on campus also. Um, so I think that that's just one of one of the ways that we see sort of differential support structures showing up in our, in our program. Um, the other one too, I think is just sort of related to um, identity-based issues. So, you know, for students of color, queer students, the, the the needs that they're having based on sort of these experiences, these negative experiences that are happening all across our campus. Um, you know, our counseling services are low. And once again, I'm the only person in the program. Um, so when I'm trying to be everything to everybody, um, I feel like I can't deliver that. Um, and for the most part, my white students seem to do okay here. And my Sasset students seem to do okay here. Um, so there is just sort of a differential experience that also sort of relates to the types of support structures that we're able to provide to different students here. Um, so, I mean, I guess I'll just sort of stop there. There's probably, there's some other little like nuanced details related to sort of how our program is set up, um, but it, it's probably too idiosyncratic for this conversation. <laughs> Thanks for that, Dean. And um, yeah. the other thing I think is interesting, so I've worked at Boston University, I'm now at App State, um, and at both of those places, really the package is determined by the employer, right? So you mentioned, you know, it's sort of all the same except for housing, which is the housing and room and board is part of essentially their job duty, right? Um, to sort of live in and respond and be on call. And so um, for those of us who are at programs that uh, academic affairs may pay sort of a different GA stipend and have a different package than student affairs, than athletics, than alumni association, uh, that starts to create some tension because uh, can we control um, and what people offer in terms of their educational, our educational partners, can we not? Then are students comparing, you get this much PD money, I get this much PD money, or I get zero PD money. Um, and so how is that in terms of their opportunities to continue the learning or to live, like literally to live and have basic needs and those sorts of things. So um, appreciate sort of the, the differences in how programs are set up and how that may create more or less tension uh, based on some of those things. Yeah. And I try to be really clear with them, you know, once again, through the admissions recruitment process about what 
these sort of differential experiences might look like for different you know students. And I think where we see the largest impact is that our Res Life students um, sometimes show up in the class incredibly exhausted um, and also you know not doing the reading. And so sort of the outcomes that we would associate with being in a graduate program don't always seem to be met um, when they're working 30 hours a week. Plus our, our program is a 48 credit hour program for a master's degree. So it's pretty heavy because we're a counseling based yep. program. Um, so they're taking all the counseling classes plus their student affairs and research classes. And it's a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we're just sort of dealing with those sort of tensions as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for naming those things. Um, and I want to get to some of our uh, Q&A uh, questions that are in the chat box. Before we go there, though, so these some of these differential supports, uh, Darren, might influence um, students' experiences, which then might influence their employability. So would love to hear your thoughts about how, tra how transparent do you think we are um, about employability in the field? I don't know if we're as transparent as we really need to be. And, and, and I want to kind of shift a little bit to my employability and talking about fit. So, you know, as I mentioned, in Chicago, we have dynamic conversations and we've been living in a political social climate of the last 18 months that's dynamic, to put it diplomatically. But there's a level of conversation we're having at Loyola, situated at an institution that's grounded in social justice in an urban environment that is not going to be the same as my counterpart in other parts of the United States. What I have to support my students with is they think about employability, because I think employability is twofold. Not only is it the employer who's, co who's curating a relationship with the employee, but the employee is curating a relationship with the employer. And so I have to tell my students, one, social justice is expensive. And so people say social justice a lot, but they're not necessarily ready to put the resources where it is. So let's have honest conversation about where we really are going around diversity, equity, and inclusion. The second piece is understand what are your non-negotiables. There are going to be places where you go to that you're going to be super surprised at where they're at around political and social commentary of the day. And you've got to really be clear with yourself if you're going to be able to work and serve in a space like that. Because sometimes I don't know, and I love the way we talked about what it should be and what it is. I don't know if what student affairs is as a profession, what we call it to be, is what higher education is as a profession and what it's calling itself to be. And that tension continues to emerge. And so I think as higher education practitioners and as faculty, we gotta be honest about the diverse topography of institutions that are here within the United States and abroad so that students can make powerful decisions about where they're gonna go with a clear understanding that what the conversations may look like at Appalachian State will not look the same at Northern Arizona, will not look the same at Merrimack, will not look at the same at University of North Carolina in Charlotte, will not look the same in Cincinnati, and certainly won't look the same in Chicago, Illinois. Yeah, thank you for that, Darren. Uh, appreciate those. And I think uh, to Ryan's point earlier about, uh, you know, the job market, we've lost a lot of jobs in higher ed, maybe more so than ever uh, in the past year. Um, and sort of what are the realities of the job market? As a first generation college student, you, I thought, and, you know, uh, I know other people think that I get a master's degree, a master's degree pipelines me to a specific job, and it's gonna be easier maybe to get a job. Um, and it's a tough market. It's a tough market non-COVID times. It's a tough market now. Um, and I was sharing with students in class uh, this week that, you know, my last practitioner search after my doctorate, I applied for 46 jobs, got 12 first round interviews um, and got three offers, right? Um, and so it, the law of diminishing returns in some ways are, are better returns as I went, but um, that even when you have a quality experience and you have good skills and uh, you've learned a lot through your graduate education, uh, it can still be a rough market. And so uh, what does that mean? And to Susan's point from earlier, it's a tough market and, uh, you know, there are some, uh, challenging realities to uh, what we pay people and how we treat people uh, from going through that process as well. Um, so thank you for sort of all your comments on our set questions. And I'm going to kick it over uh, to Dr. Miller to attend to some of our um, attendee questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Yes. And we have some wonderful questions coming in and please keep those coming. We're, we're happy to see those. And I think this first one, actually, it's a good segue from, from what you were just talking about. And it's around that notion of increase, increasingly some graduates from programs, both at the master's and doc level, um, may leave higher ed or, or never work full time in higher ed and may go into corporate or for profit or nonprofit. And, um, and so the question was, you know, how can we help foster the idea 
that if traditional higher ed does not work out, whether faculty or admin, that you're not a failure, that these degrees can be used to contribute outside of traditional higher ed. Um, and I just add to that, you know, are, are you seeing that from your vantage point? And, you know, what do we do with this idea of students who have invested a lot and perhaps leave the field very early on or maybe never even never have a full time job within our field, but have, you know, invested so much. I'll just say really quickly, I, we're about creating a place of purpose and purpose invokes vocation and vo vocation invokes calling and calling transcends one discipline. And so I had a student who was in my leadership class and was working part-time at Jenny's Ice Cream and wanted to do her leadership program on Jenny's Ice Cream. She's like, Darren, I know this is outside of higher ed, but could I do it? I said, absolutely. And then her management saw it and she went to the headquarters of Jenny's because they wanted to talk to her about potentially working full time at Jenny's. And she's like, but I'm getting my degree in higher education. And I said, what I want you to be is a social justice educator. That work can take place in the multitude of places that might be within mm -hmm. higher education institutions that might be outside. But if we're continuing to agitate spaces to be more inclusive, to be more caring, to be more just, then I think we're doing the great work. And, and uh, I was in a webinar with Dr. Chris Wren and Chris was talking about how we need to talk more about the transferability of our work within mm -hmm. higher education to other disciplines. And I, I think that Chris was spot on in that conversation. I hope that that's something that as practitioners and faculty, we can start to do more of, which is talk about that transferability. I appreciate that, Darren. I was thinking back, um, actually 20, it's my 20th anniversary for finishing up from uh, my master's program at Florida State. And when we graduated of uh, the 16 of us, one of my cohort mates never actually went into the field. He knew about the transferability that we received in our program and he went straight into pharmaceutical sales. So of the entire core, he's the only one that never went into the field and did very well for himself and talked about how there was so much transferability from the education that we received as a graduate program that enabled him to go into farm sales. And a lot of us stayed shocked, but he also reminded us, I'm also gonna probably make more finances and salary than you folks will because you're going into your first field, the first job into higher ed. Um, and I'm sure we, you know, in, in hindsight, I'm sure he did super well for himself, um, but I appreciate that he was able to make that uh, application to transferability. But the reality is he also knew that he had been burnt out from his assistantship and uh, fraternity sorority life and he was done with it. And he said, at that point, I need to see something different, but I also want to utilize the skills that I've gained. I'll say too, um, and um, maybe somebody else who's worked with this population more, but as we think about doc programs as well, I think that uh, there is some socialization in doc programs and that creates some tension around employment and employability. Um, most, mo not all, a lot of doc programs are at R1, R2 sort of institutions. And um, we may be socialized as doc students, I feel like I was, to believe that the only route after a doc program is a faculty job and the only faculty job is a tenure track job and the only, the, those only exist at R1, R2s. Um, and so how do we sort of expand that for doctoral students as well? Um, and think about all the myriad of ways through administration or policy or governmental work or um, other sorts of things as well, because I think that uh, for some doc students, the faculty route is great. Uh, and we know the faculty market may be even, be even more sort of contracted uh, than the administrative market as well. And so, yes, this applies to master students. I think it also applies to doctoral students um, and sort of how we um, pressure uh, in some ways, in my opinion, uh, people to believe that there is only one route that will be considered successful uh, by their faculty uh, and or by the field writ large and everything else is a failure. And I would completely disagree with that. Um, and I, I was with doc students at AERA thing earlier this week. Um, and I, I, that was sort of the impression I got from some of them. So I, I wanna pose, there's um, two related questions that came into the Q&A about back on this thread sort of of providing support to graduate students and, and in particular being situated at institutions that don't offer much in the way of, of really any support for graduate students. I'm curious to hear about institutions that do that well, but I think it goes back to what Dean was saying too about being or sort of feeling like we may be in a small faculty, the only sort of support people um, for students in our programs. and. Um, so, so that was raised in two questions and I'll, I'll elaborate on one of those. Um, one tension we encounter in our program relates to creating an access and opportunity by keeping barriers to admission low. 
but we also struggle to fully support students who need more academic support and development, given that graduate level um, student services are basically non-existent at the institution. If our students are to receive extra support or services, it's from us. So curious if anyone has navigated that. I, I would say yes, I certainly have over the years. Um, I've watched our um, institutional resources for undergraduate academic support just explode and um, we have one writing writing tutor at our writing center dedicated to graduate students. We have 1200 graduate students. Um, so I am always raising this issue and saying it is unreasonable to expect graduate students to come in fully prepared to do graduate level work all the time from everywhere from every background, from every major, from every institution everywhere in this country and beyond. Um, and, um, and sometimes I'm surprised at a response I get, which sometimes I hear as, well, the faculty should just be providing all the extra support. In some cases, I agree with that because I think, you know, it's our coursework, it's our um, skill set that we're trying to impart and we can and should help. But it, I say that as a person with two full-time colleagues someone running a program by themselves, like Dean, I mean, it's impossible. Um, and furthermore, it doesn't hold our institution's feet to the fire around providing communities of support where students are and become and are supported in becoming um, people who tap into resources across their institution, which is what they're gonna need to do as practitioners. So I think ethically, we cannot take on full responsibility for helping our students build a graduate skill set. We must, and I say this to all my colleagues out there who are tenured, who have job security, we have to continue to push to hold our institutions accountable for providing better support, academic support for our graduate students because most of us were not trained to be composition and rhetoric instructors either. Um, so it's just not, not on our skill set either necessarily. So we need to continue to push, push on that. I'll uh, add to, to something that Dean was saying earlier um, around sort of mental health needs um, and supports for students um, and how um, not only in terms of identity and representation and who people may want to sort of share their life experiences with and receive uh, counseling services from, uh, but also, um, you know, if you are at an institution that is in a more rural or remote location, uh, what are the community-based services as well? Are those accessible? Does student health insurance allow them to go to those places? Um, and so as I think about the sort of the increasing um, need uh, for mental health supports for graduate students, I mean, they've always been there. I think it's elevated right now. I also think about the limitations both on campus, but maybe also in the community um, to help students get the type of counseling uh, they may need or prefer. Pose one, one more interesting question. Um, so working in student affairs, our students will consistently be aware of and exposed to tensions as a practitioner. Tension of ideal versus reality, individual versus collective, espoused versus enacted values, wellness versus exhaustion, and the list goes on. How do you prepare students for, um, for working through these tensions? And it, it really strikes me that goes back to this idea of preparing students for, for what is versus maybe where we might like to move the field. I think this one is really difficult and I see this quite a bit in my program. Um, and probably for a wide range of factors, like they didn't realize the city was gonna be so small. <laughs> they just can't survive here as people. Um, but also as I started with our division is not really a traditional division. We've, we've had pretty toxic leadership here for the last six years um, across all levels. And you know, a lot of our folks don't come from student affairs backgrounds. So they just don't really understand like what we're trying to do here. Um, <laughs> and a lot of them want to leave our program after the first year because they just say this wasn't what I was expecting. Um, and so I don't know if I need to do a lot of that education for that. I, I try to, you know, I try to be very real with them, but they, they get it pretty quickly in their um, GAs. Um, and so one thing that I've tried to do, um, I reshaped our entire curriculum um, over the last couple of years. And so um, all of our electives, well, they previously had no electives, but now they have electives. All their electives and practicum classes are now taught by professionals in the field. 
Um, and so I think that that's a really great perspective for them to have. Um, and it helps students make meaning of their experience and to maybe reveal some of the politics and things that are happening within their division so that they can make better decisions about their future and what they want to do and um, how they can sort of exist within student affairs as full whole beings. Um, so, you know, I do a little bit of that work sort of organizationally with who I recruit to, you know, teach our courses. Um, you know, we try to talk about these realities starting in their very first intro class. Um, and they get that real world experience as soon as they get here, um, which sometimes leads to them switching into another program that's like a one year human relations program so that they can get out pretty quickly, which is always sad, but it happens. Thanks for bringing that up, Dean, because that's something that we do, those of us that are tapped at, at least at UC, to serve as adjuncts for our program. So myself, uh, my peer assistant vice president for leadership and engagement, um, my vice president for student affairs, um, one of the things that we're, we're really prideful of is that we do have the opportunity to teach these courses. Um, there's not a day when we've taught them that we've not provided them real-world examples of what it's like to be a practitioner and what's going on with us in our daily, in our daily positions and so forth. Students have appreciated that. They definitely see the theory to practice and we're integral in making sure that we're demonstrating that because um, we tell them this is exactly what it's like once you go into the field. And they appreciate that they get to see that from their ed faculty, but they also get to see it from us from the practitioner lens as well. I think the other thing to complement what's been said already is that we've got to continue to talk about therapy and our higher education programs and talk about therapy as a powerful tool when you're moving into new spaces. If I am working in a toxic environment, if I'm in a remote part of the country that I haven't been to before, those things coupled with the pandemic are going to absolutely put me in a powerful place where I might benefit from therapy. And I don't think we talk about it enough. And especially when you work in student affairs that is supporting field, we had, uh, I was on a team here at Loyola and when George Floyd's murder happened, someone said, well, we need to reach out to the vice president of human resources to see what she's going to do to curate support services. I said, before you ask her what she's gonna curate, ask her how she's doing as a black woman raising black children, seeing this type of trauma on television. Ask her that question first, before you ask her the question of what is she going to do in terms of trainings and response from the university. We are so often so quick to put on other people's emotional, physical face masks before we put it on our own. And we can't continue to be a sustained field that's going to sustain people in the field if we don't really start talking about our own mental health, our own wellness in these conversations. I guess one thing, um, and as I'm um, hearing you all talk about these questions that are in the Q&A, but also the questions we asked earlier, I guess one of the things I wonder is, um, do you think that uh, other folks on your campus or um, more broadly than that, maybe in the field at large, um, feel the same tensions? Like, are we sort of on the same page about these tensions per the survey Ryan did? Uh, it seems we are, but uh, do you think that outside of sort of the folks who are um, integrate into graduate education, higher ed student affairs, so GA supervisors, faculty, et cetera, outside of us, do you think other people sort of feel these same tensions or is it like, hey, that's in your sphere, take care of it? I think I would say it's some, it's some of both. I think some of our colleagues really care about these issues and the impact they have on students and think of them as ethical quandaries that we need to address. And I think other folks feel like you know what, graduate, it's sort of that mentality of graduate school is hard for everyone. Everyone's low income in graduate school, everyone struggles, just, just do it. Um, I see the whole spectrum of attitudes represented in our profession. I'm con consistently just flabbergasted by um, the elitism that I will hear people bring up and parrot and say, well, you don't wanna go to this grad program or that grad program. You want the name, you want the reputation, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm just always just gobsmacked by that, but it's, it's real, it exists in our field from both from practitioners and faculty. And what I wish we could do more of is have more honest conversations about who does that serve? You know, I, I mentioned this the other day in our planning meeting, but I think that our work needs to be 
centered and oriented around what is going to serve our students and their futures best. And I think a lot of what we do serves ourselves um, or our reputations or our futures or our program's names. And I wish we could have more honest conversation about that. I think if we could, we could, we could make headway on it, but I don't hear a lot of people talking about that. So thank you for talking about it, letting us talk about it. Any other folks have opinions about that? Yeah, I, I think it, what you're saying, Susan, is really interesting. And I think um, it can be hard sometimes. And, and I saw some of the questions or something in the chat box of people talking about um, for those of us who are not at R1, R2s, uh, what does it look like? Because sometimes graduate education is not forefronted at those institutions. And to your points earlier about academic resources, and uh, we talked a little bit about mental health resources, but um, just in general, it's sort of seen as a um, money mechanism for the institution, which is what the person in the um, mentioned, uh, and not necessarily a, a sort of a, a primary population uh, to sort of serve and cultivate at the institution. And so, uh, and then I also think uh, when your parts about sort of elitism and, and ethics is uh, that's not like it's in both the master space and the doctoral space. Um, and so, what does that mean? And how do we respond when somebody tells us they went to institution X versus institution Y? Like, is there a visible response in our response or body language of, oh, that's so impressive, or Oh, cool. Like, I don't know where that place is. Um, and, and I think that uh, that speaks to sort of the broader issues around, um, you know, classism and, you know, racism and um, elitism uh, in the academy as well. And so sort of what does that mean? And um, I know that we've chatted a little bit in our prep conversations about then does that translate right when people go out on the job market? Um, and do we will we have had the opportunity? I think about my own choices and where, where I went to graduate school both times. And it was solely based on money because that was what it had to be based on for me. Um, and so it wouldn't have mattered where, you know, the offer was about the money. It wasn't about the name of the institution. And so are we judging students on uh, metrics by which they really didn't have uh, influence or options um, and other people did? Ryan, do we want to, I think we're almost out of time here. I think we are, yes. Um, so we should probably start to wrap up, but I know that we want to continue this conversation because many um, important issues have been voiced today. And I think we have some, some ideas about how to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So as we think about ways sort of we're moving forward and things of that nature, um, so we do hope uh, to continue this conversation. Um, so we're hoping at uh, Ash at the KHEP Precon uh, to continue this conversation as well, if that's a possibility, uh, ideally at ACPA and NASPA uh, as well. So we'll see sort of how the program uh, proposal submission goes. Um, and then I also seen things in the chat box. Uh, I saw Dan commenting around CAS and uh, some other organizations as well. So uh, we you know, welcome others to sort of take this conversation and bring it to other spaces. We're hoping to take that conversation and bring it to other spaces. Um, it is not our conversation, it is our conversation. Uh, so broadly and writ large. So encourage folks to chat with folks. I saw people making comments about, can we talk across our state or our region? Um, welcome those uh, conversations as well. We hope to more formally chat about this Again, like I said, at ASH, ACPA, and NASPA, and not only what the tensions are, uh, but how we can manage and reduce those tensions as well.